And good evening. It was billed as a debate that was make or break for all the candidates. And each of those candidates on stage right now came to make a mark. Good evening. I'm Tom Yamas here in Miami. I'm Hallie Jackson alongside Tom here in the spin room. As you are looking live at these candidates on stage, one of the most intriguing parts of the post-debate procedure here, greeting spouses, kids, people who have come to see them here at the Adrian Arsht Center, where we are located here in Miami. Two fiery hours, two substantive hours. Some shots fired at Donald Trump, at President Biden, at each other, Tom, with these candidates now taking a moment here. As we watch some of the interactions, we saw that brief handshake between Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis. We saw Nikki Haley, Chris Christie interacting, and there, Tom, is Vivek Ramaswamy. Along with his wife, Approva, and something we did see as well, Vivek making a quick U-turn, avoiding Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley's daughter on stage right now next to her. As you remember, she was invoked in this debate. Ramaswamy going after her, saying she had downloaded TikTok. She was on TikTok, essentially saying that Nikki Haley was a hypocrite for attacking him for being on TikTok. And then Nikki Haley calling him a scum. It was the pivotal moment in this debate, I would argue. The former U.N. ambassador clearly taking exception with how personal Ramaswamy got, invoking her daughter, who was obviously in the debate hall, joining her now here on stage. And look at this, Tim Scott, but we, Senator we, Scott, we, and Governor Christie. Excuse me, Haley, I think we should go back to, to Ramaswamy. It looked like he was shouting or speaking to someone in the front row. He had some very, very tough words for the RNC chair, Ronna McDaniel. Again, it looked like he was talking to somebody in the front row in sort of a very loud manner. We know they went back and forth. And from what we understand, the RNC chair, when she was getting attacked in the middle of the debate, really in the first few minutes of this debate, she was not too happy. We're going to ask our producing team to take a look at that interaction there as we're watching some more of it here on stage. This debate, in large part, at least in the first half, dominated by foreign policy here. Fitting, given the backdrop of that war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, you heard candidates draw distinctions on some of these foreign policy topics on China, for example, on Ukraine, and specifically on Iran, where we heard some new announcements here from Senator Tim Squad as we're taking another look here at Vivek Ramaswamy. Some of these candidates are sort of talking to some of the supporters, some of the donors who are in the hall, 1,500 people here for this debate, Tom. I see Vivek there with his young son. I got to give props to, to Vivek's son for staying up this late. <laughs> it looks like he's speaking now to, to Ronna McDaniel. Can't make her up exactly, but it looks like they may be having the exchange. Look, this was a big debate. Uh, Vivek came out here. He attacked the moderators. He attacked the media. He attacked the RNC for setting up this debate the way it was. And, and for a lot of the debate, he was on the attack. It was Vivek first the rest of the room. When we look at the rest of the candidates and who received a lot of that incoming, we start with Nick Haley. It then goes to Governor Ron DeSantis, who was center stage, of course, the hometown hero, if you will, in his state of Florida. And then Vivek in third place, uh, getting other attacks as well. But he clearly was on offense tonight, Haley. One of the biggest questions, Tom, had been, would this debate change the game, given where things stand politically? Because obviously we had these five candidates on stage. Donald Trump, over the course of the last two hours, has not been in this building. He's about 20 minutes away, holding his own rally in Hialeah. The question is, did any voters' minds change? Because right now, Donald Trump is not just ahead in the polls. He is dominating in the polls, specifically in the early states of Iowa and New Hampshire as well, as we're taking a live look here at former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, again, greeting people there in the crowd. We should mention Senator Tim Scott, along with his mother, his biggest supporter. She was at the debate. He invoked her as well now with his nephew here on stage. Senator Scott had some big moments, too, talking about what it means uh, for gas prices, that gas prices, when they are on the rise, they are a crisis in the American family. Also saying that raising the retirement age for Social Security would be so hard for so many people, including Iowa farmers. There's also a question, and it may be tough for Senator Scott to hear, if he will be on the debate stage for the next one, because he is somebody who has made the threshold, but just yeah. barely for these debates, both him and Chris Christie facing that reality here. Tom. Yeah, so I, I think Nikki Haley has walked off the stage now without looking at or shaking Vivek Ramaswamy's hand. I think we hopefully will have a chance to speak to her yeah. in a few moments, and we'll ask her about all those exchanges. And that is because we are here live in what's called the spin room here in Miami. The candidates are going to be walking right behind our set where we are now. The room is filling up with reporters, photographers, looking to get some of the reaction here from what we've just seen over the course of these last two hours, you heard not just foreign policy, not just the economy, but this issue of abortion access specifically right toward the end, given what we've seen in the last 24 hours. Of course, that election where in states like Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, you saw voters move to protect that access. One thing we didn't hear a lot of was former President Trump. That's right. And I want to go to our Garrett Haig right now, who can explain to our viewers who have been watching this debate for the last two hours. Garrett, it's been polled that when these Republican candidates attack the former president, even though they're trying to beat him and they're running against him, it actually hurts them. 
Yeah, that's right, Tom. There was such a cautious manner in which these candidates tried to separate themselves from the front runner who's been dominating this race. You heard them do it in a way where they basically wrapped their criticisms of Donald Trump in praise of his presidency because they're trying to give a permission structure to his voters to say, yes, I liked him then or I liked elements of what he did then, even if he's not the candidate for me now. And that's based in sort of a factual basis based on some of our own polling, which has found that attacking Donald Trump Trump directly can make a candidate less popular with the very Republican voters they are trying to win over. It's something that Chris Christie has struggled with. It's something Mike Pence struggled with. Part of the reason he's not in this race anymore. So you saw these candidates in this real bind. None of them can be the Republican nominee unless they go through Donald Trump to get there. It's just mathematically not possible. But to do that, I think all of them are making similar calculations about trying to be the last person standing or hoping someone else will do the dirty work for them. And if we end this election cycle, if we end this primary cycle with Donald Trump once again as the Republican nominee, I think debates like this one, huge stages with lots of eyeballs on them and these candidates not taking the opportunity to draw more direct contrast with the front runner who's been squashing them in state and national polls is going to be part of the reason why we could end up in that same place like we saw in 2015 into 2016. Garrett, you make the important point that while there is some framing here that this is a race now to see who can take that second place position and take on Donald Trump perhaps in a closer to one to one matchup. They are running out of time. Of course, the Iowa caucus yeah, just 68 right. days away. Garrett Hake, thank you so much. Let me pick up here in the spin room with our panel who is joining us here on set. Former Deputy Press Secretary for former President Trump, Hogan Gidley, former Republican Congressman from right here in Southern Florida, Carlos Carvello, and conservative columnist Mary Catherine Ham. We are glad to have you all here. Hogan, I'll start with you because you are somebody who is in touch, of course, as a former uh, Donald Trump staffer with that right. team. You understand this Republican Party. What's your biggest takeaway from the next? I think, look, you're running a primetime debate. You have primetime players up on stage, but the primetime person that everyone wants to see is Donald Trump. He's not here. It's difficult for anybody to gain oxygen when he sucked it all out of the room. Even though he's not here, he obviously looms large. People had some moments here, obviously, and I talked about this before the debate. What you want to do is create a moment. You want to take that moment and build it into momentum and ultimately a movement. Remember, Kamala Harris had a great moment on the debate stage in the Democrat debate when she called Joe Biden a sex criminal and a segregationist. She had t-shirts ready, it was good to go, and then it just fell flat and went away. There were some moments tonight where people had some zingers for each other. They said some things to Donald Trump, about Donald Trump, but I don't know that that's going to change the calculus at all because Donald Trump wasn't here and he is the front runner. Hallie, as you said, by many, many points. And we are just moments away from hearing from Governor Ron DeSantis, who was center stage. Carl, this is your state, Florida. I do want to ask you, texting with a lot of Republican viewers, people who are in the, the hall, people who are watching at home, I'm getting a lot of texts that that Nikki Haley had a big night. Was she the winner in tonight's debate? Well, I think Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis had strong performances. Tom, this was a different debate than the ones the previous two. There was not a circus-like atmosphere. Right. It was very substantive. It was very serious. I think the moderators did a great job. And uh, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis did what they had to do tonight. They showed that they were competent. You know, a lot has been said about Ron DeSantis and his personality. And his did, he, did he I shine thought, enough? Did he I, shine I enough thought tonight? Ron DeSantis would have, was at ease tonight. He was comfortable. Maybe it's because he's in his home state. It's warm here in Miami. Maybe that <laughs> helps, right? So I really do think that those two candidates kind of reestablished or reaffirmed their positions as the leader of this pack, the race for second place. Mary Catherine, you heard the congressman talk about how Ron DeSantis seemed comfortable on this stage in his home state. Nikki Haley, of course, former U.N. ambassador, foreign policy is in many ways her wheelhouse. And yet one of the biggest moments for her was her clapback at Vivek Ramaswamy when he went after her daughter, as we talked about, when he talked about her high heels as well. Yeah, yes, please, have at it. I wanted her to note how high her heels were and to clap back at that. And I wanted her to say that her daughter's off limits. By the way, her daughter is grown. She's not supposed to be dictating her social media presence at this point. And if she did, we would call her a weirdo for doing that. Uh, and no man would be asked about how he was monitoring his children's social media presence. So there's that. Um, look, I do think Ron DeSantis did seem comfortable. Um, and the thing about uh, that Hogan's doing is that building momentum is key, right? So I think having a good night tonight where he he came right out of the gate coming after Trump a bit, saying he should answer your questions here on this state was, stage was good. Plus the uh, Kim Reynolds endorsement in Iowa, build on that a little bit. 
you have a little bit of momentum at your back. Hogan, you, you know former President Trump well. How would you rate how, how former Ambassador Nikki Haley and Governor Ron DeSantis handled Vivek Ramaswamy? Because I think that if you can't handle Vivek on this debate stage, how are you going to handle Donald Trump? Again, some have some good moments, some have some cringe moments. I thought the back and forth was interesting. It's obvious that Vivek Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley do not like each other. Yeah. They went after each other the whole time. Ron DeSantis got into it to some degree uh, with the China issue in South Carolina. They went back and forth over that. Listen, I do think that DeSantis and Haley clearly are cut above the rest of the field at this point. Nowhere near where Trump is, obviously, but they are separating themselves. You're right. It was a very substantive debate. They didn't step on each other. It wasn't a melee and they weren't yelling at each other. It didn't look like a food fight. They were trying to tell the American people, here's where we need to take this country and I'm the best person to do it. The problem is I think the front runner has a better shot at that at this point. As we're having this conversation, just so people at home know what you're seeing on screen, that is the backstage area. As the candidates are coming off stage, they are heading into the room behind us here, the spin room, which as you can probably see is already filling up. It is getting louder. You see Governor Ron DeSantis there along with his wife. Congressman, let me ask you as our South Florida resident here, did Senator Tim Scott and former Governor Chris Christie do enough? We know that Tim Scott is banking it all on Iowa. Chris Christie is banking it all on New Hampshire. Did they do enough to stay in the conversation here? Allie, I don't think they did enough to break through. I mean, status quo, sure, maybe they can stay in the race a bit longer. Maybe they can even make the next debate. But they're behind. They really need to, you know, make a leap forward. They need to do attack some of these other candidates a bit more. And they didn't really connect. I think that they did adequate performances. I mean, no one had a disastrous performance here. No one right. disqualified themselves. But I don't think Christie or Scott did enough to make it to that next level. Mary Catherine Ham. What do you think Republican voters, I, I would argue, the party is obviously fractured. Is it Donald Trump's party? Is it the, the party of Ronald Reagan? Is it the party of Tucker Carlson? It, it's unknown right now. But the debate and what was happening in the beginning of the debate, especially with the personal attacks on the RNC and then on the other candidates, who, who does that motivate to vote for? I, I, I'm kind of confused what the strategy was there in the beginning. Look, it's tricky, right? Going after moderators, I think, always works well for Republican audiences. It's not a, it's not an unusual tactic. Um, did it work out well tonight? I don't know. It's it's fine. I, I agree that Christie and uh, and Scott not exactly exhilarating tonight. I don't. I'm not sure that they should be at the next debate because of that. But here we are, and the fracturing is real. And I don't know exactly how people are reacting to this. But I talked to some voters over at uh, an Americans for Prosperity event near here in Libre Initiative, Hispanic voters who are Florida voters, and many of them. And this is something I note every time we watch a debate: women voters like Nikki Haley. And that is a thing that people have to reckon with because these suburban educated women voters are what you have to earn back in order to make the Republican Party successful again. Super intrigued as to what we're hearing from voters. And the good news is we have correspondents stationed yeah. up across the country at some of these key early states. We're going to get to some of those voter panels in just a sec. And we're going to have much more debate coverage from Miami in just a moment. From right here, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis standing by to join us in the spin room. We'll be able to talk to him about the debate and ask him some very tough questions. As we mentioned, those correspondents in key early states include Ryan Nobles, stationed out for us there in New Hampshire. Hey, Ryan, you watched the debate with some folks there. Tell us what you're seeing. Yeah, that's right, Ellie. We watched the debate with some very engaged New Hampshire voters. And guys, I have to ask you, who do you think won the debate? <laughs> Obviously, a lot of different opinions. We'll get the take of these first in the nation voters when we come back. Donald Trump's a lot different guy than he was in 2016. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. Welcome back to our coverage of the third Republican debate here on NBC News. I'm Hallie Jackson. And I'm Tom Yamas. We are live tonight from the spin room, as you can see just behind us. The candidates are now making their way to our set after tonight's debate. And we're joined now live by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Governor, thank you so much for joining our coverage. You were front center stage, hometown hero, if you will. <laughs> this is your, your, your state of Florida. How did you feel you did in this debate? And, and are you upset that debate after debate, the former president is not there side by side debating? 
Well, I think we did really well, and I think NBC did a good job. I mean, I have uh, watched debates over the years. I participated in a couple already, and I think the people at home probably got a good viewing experience because the questions were substantive. People were able to talk. There wasn't a lot of screaming back and forth. And so I think the value of this debate was probably more than the one we did in Simi Valley. Look, Donald Trump is not the same guy he was in 2016. You would not have been able to keep him off that stage in 2016. The consultants wouldn't have been able to do that. Now, they don't want him up on the stage. When he gives speeches, it's usually off the teleprompter. And I think his view is, it's like, well, he has a polling lead. Therefore, why would he want to get involved and actually earn the job? But that's not the way this goes. So what I think you're going to see, because I'm on the ground in the early states, voters are now starting to really pay attention. It is going to hurt him if he's not willing to debate going forward, because voters expect you to earn their vote. And if you look at his support, he's got some that are rock solid. He probably doesn't have to debate. But other supporters of his are willing to go for another candidate. It sure hasn't hurt him yet so far. I don't have to tell you that in the key state of Iowa, he is up by 27 points in our most recent polling here. So let me ask you. Yeah, you but he said, he said even that poll, which is a good poll for him, he's at 42 percent. He's the most famous elected, former elected official in the world, the former Republican president, he's at 40 percent. He should be. Just think about this. If Ronald Reagan ran in like 88, Ronald Reagan would be getting 85 or 90 percent. But all Donald Trump needs is you plus one. He only needs second place plus one. I understand that. But, but here's the thing. We're in this situation now. The vast majority of people in Iowa and New Hampshire clearly do not want to nominate Donald Trump. So that is not a great position, and, and the field's going to narrow and more as we go into that. And do you say that because of where enthusiasm is? Because the polling shows that there are loyal supporters of Donald Trump who do want to see him get elected. And I ask because no, I know, but we it's heard a, you on it's stage a minority, there. though. It's a minority of the of, in those early nominating states. It's a minority. It's not a majority. You are talking about because you're in this unique position along with some of these other candidates, where you are looking obviously to win over the former president's base while also distancing yourself from him. Do you need to be tougher on him? What do you say to those critics who suggest you should be going after him harder than you? Well, have here's been? how I. View the, the Republican electorate. 25% are going to do Trump no matter what, give or take. 25% have moved on. They don't want to do it. And then the 50 in the middle, you know, they're conservative voters, America First voters. They would vote for him, but they'd also vote for someone else. I think I'm the only guy that really can play in that space of the, all the candidates here. So what you have to do is you have to prove yourself. And it's not a question of attacking him as much as just telling the truth. So, for example, when I'm on the campaign trail, I always say, he said Mexico would pay for the border wall. Now what he's saying is, well, there was no legal mechanism I could have done to do that. I think if you guys covered that campaign, he was very clear, Mexico pay for the wall. But the thing is, people told him at the time, you could tax the remittances of foreign workers and you could raise the billion. So I will actually do that. So what I tell people is, it's Governor of Florida, I delivered on 100% of my promises. I'll do that as president, but also deliver on his promises that he didn't fulfill. Governor, I'm curious what you've learned on the campaign trail, right? Campaigns aren't easy. And I want to know what you're telling your voters and your donors, because a year ago, a Wall Street Journal poll had you 14 points above former President Trump. And so it seems as Republican voters have gotten to know you more, your poll numbers have dropped. I don't think so, that's it. So I don't think that's learned? it. Because even this Des Moines poll, I have the highest favorability and the highest we consider. I think the issue is, if you look at the information flow, when I got reelected, I was on, I was dominating the news. Trump was not getting a lot of news. What changed was the Alvin Bragg indictment, where he started to dominate so the So you're saying again. the indictments are helping him with the GOP voters, without a doubt? It definitely helped. The Bragg certainly did. And part, and part of it is, I think they feel, and I agree with on the brag that it was not um, a valid case but it's also just the fact that if you look at the amount of media he gets versus me that the information flow in these national polls is what does it i think the difference in like in iowa and new hampshire is you have a chance to pierce through that yeah he may get five to one coverage on me but i can go shake someone's hand i can run advertising and i can try to even that out but that you're not going to see i think the sea change in that until people really start to make decisions i do think with kim reynolds endorsing me though i think that that's a big moment for the Iowa caucus, because I've talked to people in Iowa. Basically, they said, you know what? When when Governor Reynolds came out for, for the for Governor DeSantis, basically, that's telling Iowa caucus goes, you know what? You got to plug in now, and, and you're going to start seeing that. And that was only a few days ago. Let me ask you about a policy issue that's on a lot of people's minds after what we've seen in the last 24 hours. We're coming fresh off here, election night 2023, as we head into right. election 2024, and the issue of abortion access seemed to power Democrats to victories in some of these key states and in some of these key races. One of the things you alluded to on stage was that a lot of states feel very differently about the issue of abortion rights. Do you believe then that there should be no national ban, that a national ban should be off the table here? Well, what As some I, of your competitors have suggested. Well, what I've said is, is if you look at 
the practical reality of a divided country, uh, it's going to be a bottom-up situation. That's just the reality, regardless of what you think. But what I also say on this is pro-lifers in particular have a big problem on these referenda. Because if you look at, like, Ohio, a lot, chunk of those voters would vote for Republican candidates. But if the issue is presented the way it is, they're willing to vote for what, from a pro-life perspective, was a very extreme, very expansive uh, pro-abortion amendment. So I think the pro-life movement has got to start keying in on these referenda. Um, you got to be strategic about how you're doing it. You need to know the, the, the landscape that you're dealing with. There may be some states where you shoot in a certain direction. There may be others you shoot, shoot in a different one. Uh, but they have been getting their clock clean on the referenda. I think that's a big problem. I don't think it's so as big a deal. do you believe a national ban should be off the table? I don't, I don't think it's, but I don't think it's as much about the, the electoral in terms of the candidates. I, I mean, it obviously it plays a role, but good Republican candidates did very well in 2022 in the, re, in the aftermath of Dobbs. I think for our party, I think that's part of it, but I think it's also, quite frankly, the Trump factor. I think there's certain voters that he does, they don't like the Trump, uh, the, the, the Trump shtick, and they break for the Democrats, even though they think the, the, the country's going in the wrong direction. That is why I've argued, and others, and Kim Reynolds argued, uh, Donald Trump as the nominee would be a huge risk, because when push comes to shove, all these elections since Biden's gotten in, special elections, and then this, in the midterm, we should be cleaning house. He's unpopular, president of another party, and yet they're overperforming in almost everyone. And that's pre-Dobbs, too. It's not just post-Dobbs. That's why I think that's the, a big The factor. data and the election losses show Republicans may be up against some headwinds when it comes to abortion. We're going to have to wait and see until November. Governor, we Thank appreciate you. all your time. The governor and everyone on that stage hoping to change minds, right, in the key first primary states. Our Ryan Nobles is in the town of Keene, New Hampshire tonight. So, Ryan, the question of the night, did anyone gain any ground after tonight's debate? What's up? We're here at Tempesta's restaurant in Keene, New Hampshire, and these Republican voters were really keyed in on this debate today. And you mentioned that issue of abortion, and I want to talk to Doreen about that, because it was perhaps one of the biggest reactions we got in the room was Nikki Haley's response on abortion. Doreen, why were you so struck by it? Well, I am so disappointed that there are so many women in this country that vote with their emotions. And she really kind of brought out that that is what women want. And what most of them don't realize is with the overturning of Roe versus Wade is now the states have the choice. They have the choice of voting in their state elections on whether or not they want abortions for um, 15 weeks, 24 weeks, whatever it is. And um, it, the family is a huge factor in if you ask any grandparent if they would want to have their daughter have an abortion, when you see that little grandbaby down there, I, I can't believe so many women just vote on the issue of the abortion right. instead of what all these other and things. And you felt that she articulated that message yes. in a good yes. way. Okay, and great. Thank and there are so many other things in the world right. happening that we... All right, really great. Doreen, thank you for that. But we want to get back here. And 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 uh, you told me before you thought that this was the most substantive debate that you've seen up until this, this point. It was the best managed. It was the most substantive. And by consequence, it was riveting. The second debate, I literally fell asleep. <laughs> and you didn't fall asleep tonight, and that's good. And that's part because Jimmy here uh, did a good job taking care of us. But we want to get one more take here before we go. Uh, and... And ma'am, tell me, uh, and our camera here is behind us. He's coming around. Here he is. You know, what did you think was the most important issue in the conversation tonight uh, amongst these candidates? Well, I thought the idea that the world's on fire was pretty important. And the question of whether we help these countries or, or not um, was important. And I also need to repeat that I think that uh, Nikki did a good job with the abortion issue, particularly after thinking about the losses the Republican Party had yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the Democrats are making that an issue again. I would like to see it be a personal issue to all of the women here and all of the women in the country and, and not be such a public public issue that will forget about our economy and about the state of the world. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And thank you to all these voters. They say New Hampshire voters are among the most educated in the country. We saw that firsthand here tonight, Tom and Hallie. They were very engaged in this debate. And I think they learned a lot about these candidates. We'll send it back to you guys. 
They sure were paying attention. Ryan Nobles, thank you so much live for us from New Hampshire. We're going to have a lot more debate coverage from here in the spin room in Miami in just a minute, including with somebody who has just joined us here on set, the former governor of South Carolina, the former U.N. ambassador, Nikki Haley. She'll be with us in just a minute. In the last debate, she made fun of me for actually joining TikTok while her own daughter was actually using the app for a long time. So you might want to take care of your family first. Leave my daughter out of your voice. Your adult daughter. The next generation of Americans are using it. And that's actually the point. You have her supporters crapping her up. That's fine. Here's the truth. You're just the easy answer. One of the more fiery moments of tonight's debate. Welcome back to our coverage of the Republican presidential debate. I'm Tom Yamas. And I'm Hallie Jackson. We've got the candidates still making their way through their spin room here in Miami. Joining us now is somebody who was one of the biggest targets of the night, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. Ambassador Haley, thank you for being with us here. Thanks for having me. Listen, this debate was largely focused on foreign policy, but I have to start with that moment that we just saw. we got to start with scum and these attacks from Vivek Ramaswamy against you here. Can you take a minute to just reflect on that moment? Moment, what was going through your head and help us understand do you dislike him look I'm a mom I'm a mom so the second that you go and you start saying something about my 25 year old daughter I'm gonna get my back up but this is it's not even about the personal part there are serious differences that I have with him you know he doesn't think that we need to be helping Israel he sides with Putin and and thinks that Ukraine doesn't matter he's okay with giving Taiwan to China there's so many issues he doesn't think America needs friends. That's dangerous. I think he has a dangerous foreign policy um, that we can't afford, and I think he would make America less safe. He, he called you Dick Cheney in three-inch heels. Do you think that was sexist? It, it, I don't even give him the time of day. He has proven that he is just not worthy of being president of the United States. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. There's so many things that he said that were just uncalled for tonight. But, you know, I'll let people decide that. We We've got real serious issues. We've got to talk about what's happening. We've got wars all around the world. We've got an economy that's in shambles. We've got a border that's open. And we've got a lot of families that are concerned. And those are the things that I wanted to talk about, not the fact that he got my heel size wrong. So let's talk about some of those issues here, including what we just heard from with our colleague Ryan Nobles, who is live in New Hampshire, talking with voters there. I know you were listening when one of those voters talked about you and your answer as it relates to abortion access and what you would push for here. Um, you were, it seems, pushing the pragmatic in your response about what can actually get passed in Washington and what cannot. Do you believe that your competitors on stage are missing something in the dynamic here? Well, I think the fellas like deal with this differently. I look at it from the perspective that this is personal for every woman and every man in America. I had a roommate who was raped in college. I wouldn't wish on anyone what she went through wondering if she was pregnant, wondering if she was pregnant. What I'll tell you is I'm totally pro-life in every way whatsoever. I just don't judge someone for being pro-choice any more than I want them to judge me for being pro-life. So when you're looking at this, I don't want to see this divide. Women don't want to be divided over this. I want this in the hands of the people. I want it at the state's level. But if you're going to talk about a federal bill, at least be honest with the American people. Don't make them, you know, you've got Democrats making people feel scared that something's going to happen. And you've got Republicans trying to push something that's not not even realistic. So I'll ask you the same question that I asked Governor DeSantis before you. Should Republicans even be pushing a federal bill at this point, in your view? I think we always want to save as many babies as we can and support as many moms as we can. And so I think the reason why I talked about consensus is let's see where we can get 60 Senate votes. Let's see, because anything would save more babies. It would do more. And so, and as we're seeing state laws, you know, come up, it's just like I said, we don't want to see a woman who gets an abortion get put in jail or get the death penalty. There's certain things that I think there's a place, but there has to be consensus if that's going to happen. Ambassador, let's turn to Israel and Hamas. You have been attacked for saying end Hamas. Former Governor Chris Christie says, what does that even mean? My question to you is this. Israel obviously suffered a, a horrific terrorist attack. Innocent Israelis were killed. They've been kidnapped, likely being tortured in that tunnel system there in Gaza. Can you destroy Hamas without destroying Gaza? Essentially, is there any way to do this without all those innocent Palestinians now dying as well? Well, I mean,
mean, we've always focused on civilians versus terrorists. I think that's important. That's what America does. That's what Israel does. That's what civilized countries do. But the reality is, if 1,400 Americans had been brutally murdered that way and Americans taken hostage, would America be okay with that? We would not be okay with that. What we have to remember is here you had 1,400 people, but we had 33 Americans that were murdered. We have Americans being held hostage. This is not just personal for Israel, it's personal for America. And so when you look at that, we have to eliminate Hamas. I dealt with this every day. What I can tell you is Israel is not going to do this without thinking of every single human so, life. The problem is Hamas does not think of every single human life. I've been in those tunnels, yeah. and those tunnels are underneath hospitals, they're underneath playgrounds, they're underneath schools, because they use women and children as human shields. The best way to save people in Gaza is to eliminate Hamas, because they should not live under so that no rule So no ceasefire, no humanitarian pause. You would not encourage that. You would not fight for that if you were president right now. If you do a pause, if you do a ceasefire, people die. Because we've done this before. And what Hamas did before, they killed Israeli soldiers and they took more Israeli soldiers hostage. That's what would happen. They refuel to try and get ready so they can shoot more rockets. What they need to do is they need to let out every hostage they have. And we're not going to talk to them until they release every single one of those hostages. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, thank you so much for your time here after this third Republican presidential primary debate. Appreciate you being with us. Thanks so much for the time. we got a lot more to get to coming up here. Our Shaq Brewster is at a viewing party over in the key state of Iowa outside Des Moines. Shaq, talk to us. How did the debate go over there? Well, Hallie, let's ask them directly. Hey, guys, can you raise your hand for me if at this point, two months from the Iowa caucuses, you have pretty much made a decision on who you support? We'll dig into those answers after this break. We are live here in Miami, giving you a little bit of a behind-the-scenes tour of what this arena, what this debate site actually looks like. The candidates walk down this hallway after coming off the debate stage and head here to where we've been coming to you from into what's called the spin room. These are all our friends from various media agencies, reporters from lots of different outlets. They come in to hear from if not the candidates, then at least campaign staff, surrogates who have come here into the spinner. Let me take you further into this a little bit. It's pretty packed out here. And if you're wondering what happens, you can see each of the surrogates has a sign. Tim Scott's team is here. Vivek Ramaswamy's team is over there. You've got Governor Ron DeSantis's team here as well. And this is all about trying to help set the narrative now as we are post-debate heading into the next piece of this, right? The push to Iowa just 68 days away. These candidates are hoping to have their teams help frame some of what that momentum, some of what the conversation is going to be about when you wake up tomorrow morning. Tom? Ms. Jackson, we have questions for you. Can, can you come over here? We have questions for you. We have questions for you. <laughs> none of it, none of the spin matters if it doesn't change what voters. Come on over, Hallie. Uh, President Trump is by far the front runner nationally, as well as in the critical early voting state of here she is. Not running for office, but, but joining me live. Uh, we're going to head over to Altoona, Iowa. So this is the million-dollar question. Shaq Brewster's there with some voters inside of a bar. Shaq, you're, you are definitely the bravest one of all here, uh, being in a rowdy bar tonight. Were any minds changed there? <laughs> Well, Tom, I'll tell you, you know, one of the first things, we're crashing this party here. So there's food, there's drinks, they're welcoming us here. But let me ask that question. Uh, guys, can you raise your hand? One more show of hands. Raise your hand if any minds were changed by the debate performance tonight. Some minds were changed here. Kyle, we were talking earlier. You came in a little bit undecided. What are you thinking right now? Um, I'm probably going to either caucus for uh, Haley or DeSantis, and that's my two. Why those two? I think they would both make good presidents. I think they have strong policies, and I think they could win. We saw in the latest poll, they were actually tied. How are you going to make a decision? What's going to distinguish one or the other? Well, there's two months left of this campaign, so I'm sure, you know, a lot of things will happen in that time. I'll tell you, that is one of the most Iowan answers, because earlier he told me that he was going to wait until the actual caucus day to make a final decision. I want to talk to you guys about this. What are you thinking? What did this debate change for you? I was excited about Vivek early on. He captured my attention, but um, I've been thinking that he lacks a few things, and I also like DeSantis and Haley, but I do need some more time. I may have to make a checklist. 
What, what's on that checklist? How are you going to make this decision? Well, I, first of all, I feel like any five of them would have been better than the corrupt and incompetent leadership that we have now. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, but I feel like there's the, the world order is fracturing a little bit, which is what concerns me about Vivek. He doesn't pay enough attention to that. I like that he talked about the, the war at home, and I, that's what I really like about him. But that world order fracturing a little bit. We, we may be in a pre-war era here. And I feel like we need really competent, serious, and sober leadership. And so whoever can give me the best read on that is who I'll probably support. Thank you very much. And, you know, for you two, we talked earlier and you came in. You said you were leaning Donald Trump. What are you thinking right now? Well, probably still. However, um, as I've been telling you and other people, there's a lot that still could happen. Um, and I don't mean bad things, just things that could maybe happen that, um, I, I, who knows? Um, so my allegiance is still with Donald Trump, but I really like the way that Ron DeSantis came out, I think, much stronger in this debate than he did in the first one. I liked his answers that were very direct. They were very understandable. I liked that his military background came out. Um, I still um, swing back to Donald Trump, who kept peace for four years, and he was very, very strong in keeping peace. I like that. Um, I think that Ron DeSantis could actually do the same thing for us, you know, if he were elected. Let me get one more person here, or let me actually toss back, and I'll do one, one final show of hands. We're in Iowa. These are the voters who are going to get to have their say first. Tell me, who do, do you think for the next debate, should Donald Trump be on the stage? Raise your hand if the, you think he should be on stage. You see nearly the entire room. We'll send it back to you. Yeah, they want to see him. It's unclear if they ever will. Shaq Brewster uh, in Iowa tonight. Shaq, thank you. Join us now live. One candidate who is really trying to pick up some of that voter support, Senator Tim Scott. Senator, you have made your personal story, right, part of your campaign. Yep. You, you had two moments I thought resonated. One, talking about how high gas prices are actually a gas crisis in some families. Yes. And also talking about Iowa farmers and how if you raise the retirement age physically, it could hurt them, almost kill them. 100%. When you think about the Iowa farmer, there's no doubt about it that the physical wear and tear on your body is tremendous. So when you're talking about raising the, the retirement age from where it is today by a year or two or three, that is devastating to the average person who is a blue collar worker. I think we should take into consideration the fact that it's not just Social Security that is a challenge. It's all of our mandatory spending and frankly, our annual appropriations that has skyrocketed. That's why I talked about going back to pre-COVID levels of appropriations on an annual basis as well as dealing with the overall state of spending so that we can manage our resources better. But we have to actually increase the economic activity in the private sector so that it converts to more resources in the public sector and cut our spending. I'd like to lead the charge towards a balanced budget amendment. Senator, let me ask you about some of your comments on Iran and specifically yes. what sounded to my ear like a new policy that you're essentially rolling out or a new position that you're backing, which is to that the U.S. should, in your view, potentially strike Iran here. There has been a lot of concern, as you well know, about any further escalation in the region, putting the Israel-Hamas war on an even um, on an even more terrifying glide path toward broader conflict. How do you manage those two things? Very easily. What we've seen since October the 17th has been 40 attacks on military personnel in the region. What we know is that appeasement is a terrible strategy that leads to more chaos, more conflict, and frankly, if you want to reverse that, to de-escalate the situation in the Middle East requires us to cut off the head of the snake and or to strike in Iran. That is what is necessary for us to deal with the challenges that we see in the Middle East. It is really clear. Hamas gets 90% of its funds from Iran. Hezbollah, similar fashion. So what we know that we need to do in order to reduce the number of attacks, proxy attacks on our military, is not just to strike a warehouse in Syria. It is actually to turn our attention to the funders of terrorism in the region and the attacks on American military. And let us not forget, we've lost American lives. I know we, saw, we talk about now, I think it's up to 16 or 1,700 Israelis, 35 American lives. All of that blood goes back to Iran. If you want to de-escalate the situation, it starts and ends with Iran. You cannot negotiate with evil. You have to destroy it. Senator, I, you know, I ask this next question not, not easily. Um, 
Campaigns are tough. You, you sacrifice a lot of your time. A lot of people work very hard for you. You work very hard. You're, you're running around states, spending a lot of time in Iowa. The threshold for the next debate is a little tougher, right? You have to be yes. 6% national polls or in one of the first four states. You have to have 80,000 unique donors. We know it was a challenge for you to, to make it to the debate stage here. Do you think tonight is your last debate, or can you t promise your donors and your voters you're going to be there oh, uh, in a month? I'm 100% confident that 30 days from now in Alabama, we'll be hanging out, having a conversation about, wow, Tim, you, you were actually on the stage. Of course I'll be on the stage. What we saw in the last, in, the, in less than a, about a week, we saw thousands of people come and donate to our campaign, and our numbers already are helping us to qualify in Iowa for the next debate. We're not running a national campaign. We're running a campaign state by state. That's how these campaigns actually work. If you think back to 2011 and 2015, it was Herman Cain and the 999 winning in Iowa right now, 2015, it was Ben Carson. Yeah. So what we know is that the voters are just turning their attention towards this election. I'm very optimistic that we can continue to make gains. Senator Scott, we appreciate you joining us here. Yes, ma'am. After the debate on NBC News, appreciate your time. Yes, ma'am. We've got a lot more to get to here live in Miami. We're going to be back in just a second with one of the moderators. Hugh Hewitt will join us right after the break. Dick Cheney in three-inch heels. I wear heels. They're not for a fashion statement. They're for ammunition. I am telling you, Putin and President Xi are salivating at the thought that someone like that could become president. They would love to see that. All right, welcome back to our live coverage of the Republican National Debate from right here in the spin room in Miami. With us now is former Deputy Press Secretary for President Trump, former President Trump, Hogan Gidley, and conservative columnist Mary Catherine Hamm, and former Press Secretary to President Biden and current MSNBC host Jen Psaki, who we're going to talk to right after we finish with this panel. Uh, a quick uh, correction here at the at the beginning, at the onset of this broadcast. I, I, I thought we had seen Vivek and, and, and the RNC chair, Ronald McDaniel, go at it, uh, or at least they were talking to each other. Apparently, it was someone who appeared to look like Ron McDaniel. It was not indeed her. Her and Vivek have not spoken just yet. He had some very tough words for her, Ali, as you know, during the debate on a live mic, attacking her right off the bat. But so far, we've been told from the RNC they have not spoken. They have not had words. Ramaswamy also had some tough words, as we talked about with Nikki Haley as well. She had some words right back at him, as we just heard here, coming out of the break. Uh, Mary Catherine, your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I, I think he's fair game. I think it's fun to hit him. I do wonder strategically if it might be more uh, advantageous to hit Christy, who stands in between Nikki Haley and a New Hampshire good finish, right? He's a guy who's going to peel off her votes in that state. So maybe I would go after him and more missiles on his end instead of uh, on Vivek. Although Vivek makes himself a very right target. Uh, yeah, Hogan, I was going to ask, you know, Vivek called the Ukrainian Jewish president, Zelensky, a Nazi. Who, who is he appealing to with comments like that? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think some of his stances on Israel funding for example, do not line up with the majority of the base at this point. So at first, I think his stance on Ukraine was something that people shunned. And then all of a sudden, a shift began to happen when people on the on the right and the left start asking, OK, fine, you want to fund Ukraine? Fine. Where's that money going? What is it doing? Can we see some 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 accountability here? And then all of a sudden, he was kind of in the mainstream. And then he went kind of in a weird direction on Israel. It was odd. He's like, oh, you guys are agreeing with me. Now I'm going to go. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Um, I do want to bring up something about the, the exchange where he just went right after Rana, for example. Yeah. It's interesting because a lot of the people in the Republican base are furious at what the RNC does or doesn't do during these elections. Yesterday was a good example of that. People are furious that there's no ballot chase program or ballot harvest program. Early voting is not what it should be. The 72-hour plan of Karl Rove, uh, you know, years ago that was so successful. It's like we forgot how to block and tackle and do the things necessary to win those elections at the local level. I'm not saying he's right. I'm just saying there are a lot of people out there who are concerned at the future because they feel like the RNC is not doing the tedious, menial tasks needed to win elections at the local level. In the couple of minutes we have left, let me bring it back to what is the central question of what we have all sat here and watched over the course of the last three hours here, which is, did anything that happened on this debate stage change the dynamics of this Republican primary race enough to potentially topple former President Trump from that number one one position.
position where he sits atop the polls, as all of these candidates on stage hope will happen. Given what we heard from some of these voters, with Shaq, with yeah. Ryan out there in the field in Iowa, New Hampshire, MK, what say you? In this moment, no, I don't know that it's changed right. that much. What I do think it could do is lead to consolidation. I thought that Scott and Christy were not catching fire up there tonight. Christy, for one, I'm like, you're here to throw bombs. What are you doing? He's being Mr. Nice. That's what you do. <laughs> Please entertain me. And he wasn't even doing that. Uh, so I think that could lead to consolidation, which does lead to a chance. If it's Haley and DeSantis, who I think showed why they are top of the pack in this group, uh, then it gets to be a, a much closer thing for Trump. Hogan? No, I think she's right. Look, I, Donald Trump has the luxury of not coming to these things because he is so high up in the polls. I don't advise Donald Trump right now, but I would say it would be political malfeasance of me to say, come on that stage when you're up 40, 50 points and let everyone else attack you. So it makes no sense for him to be here. I do think, though, as the, as the field shrinks, there may be an opportunity for him to come in yeah. uh, and, and, and shake things up a bit. Hogan, uh, Mary Catherine, thank you. I want to bring in Jen Psaki now before we run out of time. Jen, real quick, you've been on the inside before. Tell us, who do you think the Biden campaign really wants to run against in this Republican nomination? I mean, look, I think whoever they're running, they run against, they're going to paint them the same way. And I think you'll see that and how they paint these candidates from the debate. I don't know. I mean, look, they, they are planning to run against Donald Trump at this point, as most people are. So I don't think they're planning strategies for anyone on that stage exactly. Jen, as you well know, the unforeseen event, if you will, the thing that we don't know is coming, right, is always a potential wild card between now and when voters actually start voting. Because yeah. as your former boss, I think, has reminded folks, along with people close to him, polls are not votes, if you will. Um, talk to us here about how people that you talk to on the Democratic side, and we've largely focused on Republicans because this mm. is a Republican primary debate. Of course. But what are the people you're talking to saying about the next steps here? Look, I think what they're focused on, even coming out of tonight, and I, I checked in with the campaign to see what struck out to them, is the abortion section and the Social Security section. Because to them, they are still focused on the general election. They're not engaged in the primary, right? They're focused on how they're going to run and contrast with the Republican platform and the nominee. And you can see from both the election last night, as well as kind of some of their responses tonight, that they're going to continue to run hard on abortion rights and continue to run hard on the Republican Party being the party of extremism. So I don't think that changes. I think it's going to start to harden and they're going to start to continue to make that choice, uh, you know, more harsh over the coming months. Jen, real quick, any chance because of the growing calls from Democrats that, that the president, President Biden, and the seeking poll numbers, he doesn't run in 2024? No, I don't think so, Tom. Uh, look, I think I, I worked for Barack Obama when there were lots of headlines saying, there's no way this guy's going to win. And then he won. So, no, they're not paying much attention to that. Jen Saki, thank you so much. And a big thanks to everybody who has joined us here live on set in Miami. That wraps up our coverage of the NBC News Republican presidential debate. Much more tomorrow on Today and at NBCNews.com. For all of us at NBC News, good night. And thank you so much for watching. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.